Johnny from Eurogamer here. I recently got hands on with Battlefield 5 out at E3 and based on my first impressions it feels simultaneously like a very predictable instalment in the series and also a fairly bold step forward. What do I mean by that? Well, it's clear that sticking with a historical period like Battlefield 1 was the only sensible choice for a new Battlefield game at the moment, given how tired people seem to be with futuristic first-person shooters. You only need to look at Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and then the hasty retreat to COD World War 2 to see the truth in that. While Battlefield 5 is very much a World War II shooter in terms of its theme and weaponry, however, that's about where the similarities end. In other words, Battlefield 5 is focused on being a fun video game first and a faithful historical recreation second, and while it may seem irreverent at points, to be honest, I think that's a smart decision from DICE. So with that in mind, here are five reasons Battlefield 5 has our attention. First, given we've already brought it up, I should probably talk about its level of authenticity. The weapons and vehicles and the overall aesthetic of Battlefield 5 are very convincingly World War II. As per usual, DICE has clearly put a lot of effort into making sure the armaments look convincing, have a decent sense of weight and make all the right noises. At the same time, there's an unmistakable sense with this game that it's very much a take on World War II. In the fairly brief time I had with Battlefield 5, I tried out the new Ground Forces mode, which takes place over four rounds, or days, as the game calls them. Each day has a different objective, whether that's blowing up four massive pieces of artillery before the time or the tickets run out, or whether it's a matter of capturing and holding two objectives and wearing the enemy down. These missions are classic Battlefield in terms of their structure and their ability to hold the player's attention, inviting the usual mix of careful strategy and over-the-top feats of daring do that so characterise the Battlefield series. What these missions aren't, however, are faithful reenactments of how the same engagements would have been handled in World War II. If, for example, the mission is to take out four artillery guns and you're constantly flying planes over the battlefield so troops can parachute down and assault the targets on foot, why wouldn't you just fly bombers over instead and have done? If these guns are, in fact, anti-aircraft, why fly planes over the engagement zone at all? And why give out so few sets of explosives for the mission, making it harder for squads to ferry the necessary equipment to each target should the one carrying the bomb get killed? If these sound like nitpicking questions, then good! they're supposed to, because the more of these curiosities and deviations you see, the clearer it is that DICE has focused on building an engaging multiplayer experience first and worried about true strategic authenticity second. Or perhaps third. It's hard to tell. Either way, it's a decent balance. It feels pacey without smacking of an energy drink fueled future war game with a shallow reskin. Although, talking of energy drink fueled gaming experiences, the second reason Battlefield 5 has our attention is that it's clearly been watching Battle Royale games. And I know practically every developer out there right now is keeping a beady eye on Fortnite, PUBG, and the like, but I'm not actually talking about the Battlefield 5 Royale mode that was announced by EA. More, it's actually the deployment mechanic in one of the Ground Forces days I played that got me thinking about this. On the day the Allied troops start dropping in to blow up those big pieces of artillery I mentioned earlier, the match starts for that team with a hasty jump from a plane, opening a chute and floating to the ground before starting the engagement. If you choose not to spawn on a squadmate in this mode, you'll make the jump again, only this time it's up to you to decide when to leap. This adds an interesting strategic element to deployment that's a bit different to the traditional battlefield strategy. You can survey the battlefield in first person before deciding when to jump, ideally landing right on top of your objective, or, in the worst case scenario, plopping down in the middle of an enemy squad just in time to get thoroughly ventilated. Either way, it immediately taps into that same thought process you have when preparing to drop into a battle royale match. 
where can I land that will serve me best without getting me killed immediately? It's a familiar mechanic at this point, certainly, but there's just something about seeing that kind of thing in a Battlefield game. Seeing a simple respawn take on more of an involved role than the classic deployment screen that's oddly invigorating. In other words, it's interesting to see developers with such a lengthy pedigree of making AAA games weigh in on the Battle Royale genre as part of their core franchise. Battle Royale games seem to chop and change so quickly, whereas games like Battlefield thrive on their own legacies and on players trusting in a familiar core experience. And who knows, maybe having the old guard weigh in on a relatively new and still very exciting game type will prove to be quite unpopular, or maybe it'll make Battle Royale games seem stale by comparison. Either way, at the moment it's interesting to feel that tingle of recognition when preparing to deploy yourself in a very familiar feeling Battlefield game. The next reason Battlefield 5 has our attention is in the very specific way it's going over the top. See, Battlefield 1 made a big song and dance of the hero units, or rather, the massive vehicles like the Zeppelin or Armoured Train. These were big, showy things that were designed to have a huge impact on the game, certainly in terms of drawing players' attention, if not always in changing the tide of battle. From what I saw, however, Battlefield 5 isn't so much aiming for these mobile behemoths as it is reinvigorating the smaller, more manageable vehicles. Tanks, for instance, are still very much part of the experience, and, this game being set later than World War I, they're now more capable and mobile than their venerable counterparts. What's new and definitely interesting in Battlefield 5, however, is that defensive units like turrets can now be hitched onto the back of vehicles and driven around, effectively generating armoured fortresses. I encountered these a bunch of times while playing Battlefield 5, and they were always very interesting. For one thing, there were several times when I saw a car coming and thought, OK, here comes a truck, this shouldn't be too hard to... Oh no, it's towing a mounted gun, I am already dead. But similarly, every time I saw one of these particular units rolling around the bend, I couldn't help but feel a weird sense of envy I don't normally experience with other Battlefield vehicles. There's something about the fact these two things need to be found and combined that make them feel a bit more special, and given one half was just sitting there waiting to be picked up, it inevitably made me feel jealous, like that could have been me if I'd just got to it quicker. Anyway, it's clear DICE is worrying less about gargantuan vehicles with big health pools and enormous hitboxes, and trying to reshape the smaller units and how those work. And again, it's a bit bombastic for World War II, a period we're used to regarding with a sense of solemn reverence, but it is still a lot of fun. Fourth on this list of reasons Battlefield 5 has our attention is that reviving your squad mates is a bit different, which is to say it's reduced other players' reliance on the medic class, but it's pretty bloody harrowing now. See, when you get downed in Battlefield 5, you do the usual calling for a medic and waving a bloody arm around while the life drains from your fragile body in a steady rush of crimson... thing. Now, the good news is any squad member can make a revive in Battlefield 5, although it should be noted it's only medics who can poke you with a syringe and get you back on your feet like your part jack-in-the-box. If an ordinary squaddy wants to help, they're going to have to drag you about a bit. Yep, you heard. Instead of just hovering over a downed player for a bit and pressing the right button, a successful revive from a non-medic player now involves dragging them around for a while like a fleshy, bloodied sack of potatoes. So, in other words, the medics are no longer the ones solely responsible for getting other players back into the fight, but nobody said having the rest of the squad pitch in was going to be pleasant or easy. And the final reason Battlefield 5 has our attention, actually, is in the squad system. Now, anybody who played Battlefield 1 should be very familiar with the idea of charging around the battlefield together like parts in a well-oiled killing machine. And sure enough, this team structure makes a welcome return for the latest game. Where Battlefield 1's squad structure was sometimes inelegant and, let's face it, difficult to follow if you were playing with morons, Battlefield 5's feels a bit different. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, the squads I played in during my hands-on time were made up pretty much exclusively of rubbish soldiers, and I am definitely including myself in that count, but the difference is I was much more aware in a passive sense of where my squad mates were and what they were doing. From the on-screen cues to the stern message about being the last member standing in the squad, and therefore really, really needing to get into cover, I felt plugged into the squad even when not receiving orders, which was reassuring, even if it meant my squad mates were probably aware of how badly I was letting them down. But anyway, there you have it, five reasons Battlefield 5 has our attention. But what do you think? Are you intrigued, or does this one just not seem like the right shooter for you? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, if you did, there are plenty more for you to watch on the channel. Do like and subscribe for plenty more from Eurogamer, but most importantly, thank you very much for watching, and have a lovely day.